says this is just another enemy just another enemy force bound for defeat see because any enemy that comes up against Allah Azza wa Jal, we understand they're destined for defeat nothing can go up against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and win nothing can beat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why he's all powerful Allah Azza wa Jal, he holds power over everything in the world so nothing can defeat Allah Azza wa Jal. but here's the thing there's a difference between Allah and Islam. And there's a difference between Islam and the Muslims. See, the Muslims can be defeated. Islam cannot. Islam can be attacked. Allah cannot. We have to look after ourselves. We have to take care of what is ours, of our faith, of our Islam. So long as we can hold on to our Islam, then we too can avoid defeat. How? If Islam itself can never be defeated, and we hold that same Islam within our hearts, then we can make sure that we stay on the true path. We can make sure that we are able to avoid any kind of defeat. Recite that to Allah, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I can see everybody coming in and shuffling into that tiny space. You guys can come a little bit closer, inshallah. From these days on, the hall will start to get more and more packed. Recite aloud to Allah, to Allah, Muhammad, wa Ali Muhammad, as you move forward as well. So what is it that we're trying to avoid defeat from here? What is it that we're talking about when we're talking about defeats here in these majalis? In these 10 days of Muharram, or rather these 12 days of Majalis as it is so transpired, we're looking at living our lives in this digital age. 
a new time, an unprecedented time, something that nobody was really prepared for 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Nobody really saw this day and age coming, this day and age where everything is digital. Everything is immediately available. Everything is all of a sudden right there at our fingertips. And today, at risk of going into a kind of doom and gloom type of scenario, I want to talk about the dangers of this digital age. And we're going to focus very specifically on the socials that we use. Your TikTok, your Twitter, your Instagram, your Snap. Focusing on the dangers of those. Today we're focusing on the worldly dangers, the dangers to our lives, the dangers to everything that we know, just in a worldly sense. Tomorrow we're going to look at the danger to our religion that it holds, because it does, it holds a very specific danger to our Islam, to our religion. And that, that isn't just limited to socials, but the entire digital age. But like we say, Islam cannot be defeated. Like it says here in Surah Asad, this is just another enemy force, bound for defeat. But don't worry, like I say, I'm not all doom and gloom. Inshallah, in two days' time, we're going to look at the actual benefits of it as well. Because I don't believe that we should all throw our phones away or that we should all delete our Instas and our Facebooks and our Snapchats or whatever it is. That's not what I'm here to say. That's not what I'm here to tell you guys. What I'm saying is if we're going to use these things, we have to know what we're using. If we're going to use these things, we have to know what the dangers behind it are. And just to give you a little intro into the dangers of using socials, I'm going to give you a quick quote. The quote says, I don't know a more urgent problem than this, because this problem is underneath all other problems. And the person who said that quote is a man by the name of Tristan Harris. Now, Tristan Harris, I'm sure most of you won't be familiar with the name, because he's not a very famous man. Well, he is now, but... He's not one of the household names, as you'd say. But Tristan Harris was one of the first employees at Google. One of the senior developers of Facebook, for Apple. Now see, when the people who develop these things are telling us there's no more, pro there's no more urgent problem than this, then there comes a time where we have to stop and think, you know what, maybe there are real dangers. Maybe there are things that we really do have to look at, really do have to assess and see how am I using these different socials? How am I interacting with the digital world? How am I interacting with my phone? And recognize that maybe there is some real danger behind it. So what are those dangers? I'm going to start off just by going through a few of them. Some of the less concerning ones, that's it. And I say less concerning because they're ones that we kind of realize straight off the bat. The first one is that when you've got your phone in your hand, You've got almost completely unfettered access to any website, anything you want. Anywhere you want to go on the internet, you can go there, you can find it. And the problem with that is, we have that access before we have a chance to know what's right and wrong. Before we have a chance to know, I should be going on this site and not on that site. Before we have a chance to know what I should and shouldn't be doing, what I can and can't be doing. Before I have a chance to know what's safe and what's not, and what the harmful effects of X, Y, and Z are, I have access immediately. There's nothing stopping me from going and looking at a site that I shouldn't be. There's nothing stopping me from going and searching up something that I shouldn't be. That unfettered access, that immediate availability of it, without any kind of restriction, without any kind of understanding of what it is I'm looking at or what it is I'm going towards, without any kind of education towards it, is a danger. It always has been, it always will be. And that is true for all walks of life. In the same way, if you want to read the Qur'an, but you don't want to listen to the teachings about the Qur'an, you don't want somebody to explain it to you, then there's every possibility that you will reach the wrong conclusions. As we see throughout the world, as we see in Iraq and Libya and uh, Syria, where we've got these terrorist groups saying that they're working under the name of Islam, quoting ayat of the Qur'an. Why? Because they looked at the Qur'an, but they didn't look at the people who teach the Qur'an. They didn't look at what the Ahlul Bayt Salam had to say. They didn't see what they were taught by those who understand the Qur'an. They just had access to the verses and they thought they knew what they meant. But there's so much more than just what is written on that paper. Just what was said by Angel Jibrail. There's so much more depth to the Quran. There's so much more to understand. It's in every walk of life. For instance, when I started studying philosophy, and this was philosophy at A-level in school, I was told, you know what, go for it, study philosophy, but make sure that you have someone, a teacher, a religious teacher, who you can turn back to. Why? Because they give you all the texts that say, look, this is what God's meant to be like, and this is what the world looks like, and this is what you've got, and this, that, and the other. But they don't explain it to you 
with a view that God exists, not to explain it to you with the God that God doesn't exist. That's the kind of point they try to get across in philosophy A level. Now, here's the deal. If you don't have a teacher to explain to you what's written there, it's the same proofs that God exists, but they're presented in a way that all of a sudden now I'm thinking, hmm, this doesn't really seem to add up. Maybe God doesn't actually exist. Maybe there isn't a God. Why? Because there's no teacher, nobody to explain to me, no, what you're reading, this is what it means, what you're seeing, this is what it is. So that immediate access without education in and of itself is a danger. That's not just limited to social media, that's everywhere. But then moving on. We talk about a lack of danger, there's also a lack of moderation. When I say moderation, I mean moderators. People assessing what's there to make sure that A is factually correct, but B, and it's another big problem, that it's not offensive, it's not rude. And the problem here is cyberbullying. I don't want to speak too much about it, but it's a real problem. Same way you've got bullying in schools, you've got cyberbullying online. The only difference is cyberbullying seems to be so much more prevalent, so much more dangerous. You know, in school, there's bullies, there's in school, there's people who take the mick out of you, there are people who have a laugh at your expense and whatnot. And for a lot of people that can, that can weigh heavy on them. But you go home and you can escape it. We spoke yesterday about playing video games to try and escape life. Same way you can go home, you can try and escape it. For a lot of other people, they'll develop what's known as you know, thick skin. And I'm not saying that you should just take everything on the chin, because that can weigh heavy, that can become very difficult. But some people develop that ability, that skill as well. The thing with cyberbullying is you can't switch it off. I mean, you can switch off your phone, you can put your phone away, but how many of us really do that? How many of us actually just put our phone away when things get tough, when, we get a, when you get a comment that you didn't want to get, or when you may start taking the mick out of you online? Because your phone's always there. And later on today, we're also going to talk about how much we need to pick up that phone. How much we need to look at that phone. Because we do, we find that. We find ourselves falling into those traps. The other thing with moderation is that there's so many influences on you. When you're online, there's all these different influences, all these different things that are pulling your attention towards them. And we mentioned, I think it was yesterday or the day before, People like you know, Andrew Tate or Jordan Peterson, they're giving you their views, they're giving you their opinions and whatnot, and you're listening to them, and you might listen to some of them and think, you know what, he's got a point. He's right. I'll tell you right now, Andrew Tate is not right. But here's the thing. When you hear all these opinions, there's nobody telling you that this person is right, this person isn't right, you should listen to this opinion piece, you shouldn't listen to that one. It's completely open to you. Listen to everyone. Hear everyone. But the thing is, nobody's teaching you how to filter through them yourself. How to figure out, you know what? This is right and this is wrong. This seems like it makes sense. This actually doesn't. This guy's waffling. This guy's talking sense. You need to be able to find that filter for yourself. That's one problem. That we start getting all these influences from all these different places and we don't know which ones are correct. So we could end up with thoughts, well, thoughts and thought processes that are completely incorrect. The other thing is, when you get all these opinions from, I don't know, let's say from TikTok or from YouTube or from whatever, or from Twitter, you get all these opinions, or from an audiobook or a podcast, wherever it is, you get these opinions, you hear what people have to say. Very quickly, you can lose the ability to make your own opinions. Very quickly, you can lose the ability to develop your own thoughts and your own opinions. And you guys, as you get older, you'll see this with your friends, you'll see this with the people around you. All they do is repeat other people's opinions. All they do is repeat what they've heard elsewhere. But they fail to understand how to actually look at the world with a critical view, how to actually make an opinion of their own. And you guys might notice it. And one easy example that you'll notice is, especially a lot of the younger guys, who all have mates who their entire sense of humor comes from Twitter or comes from memes that they've seen online. They can't make a joke if it's not something they've seen on Twitter, a joke that they haven't seen online somewhere. It's the same kind of thing. If you don't ever have the ability to think for yourself, then in life you're never going to be able to tell what is right, what's wrong. You're not going to be able to distinguish where to go for advice or where to go for interesting opinions or where to go for what is right as opposed to what is wrong. And the thing is, for people who can't develop those opinions, for people who can't develop their own thoughts, a, their opinion will be very easily swayed. They'll find it very difficult to stick to one thing and believe in it. 
And at the same time, they'll also find themselves unable to think in other areas of life. It leads to a lack of creativity. For instance, the difference between reading a book and watching a movie, although watching a movie might seem more interesting, more fun in the moment, reading a book will develop your imagination a lot better. So if you read the Harry Potter books before you watch the movie, you're imagining this whole world yourself. You're imagining what Ron and Hermione look like and what Harry looks like. You're imagining what Voldemort, this guy with no nose, looks like all of a sudden. You're imagining this all for yourself. But if you just watch the movie, then you're told, this is what they are, this is who they are, this is Hogwarts, this is what it all looks like. Same way, if you never actually go out and look at facts and figures and look at what's going on in the world, but instead you're just told, this is what's happening and this is what it means, this is what you should believe about it, you'll never get the ability to understand for yourself what's out there, what's going on in the world. Understand where you side, where you believe, what you think is right and what is wrong. Again, recite aloud to Allah and bring yourself forward as well. <laughs> Another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we've got all these ones that we've mentioned so far. We've got the unfair access to all kinds of sites. We've got the unmoderated influences. We've got cyberbullying. And then we've got the danger of having too much information. And the reason that that's dangerous, so surely you think, you know, Islam constantly goes on and on about how much it's important to learn. From the cradle to the grave, it's wajib for you to learn. Keep learning, keep gaining knowledge. Whatever you can, never stop learning. That's what Islam says, right? Again and again and again, no matter what you do, never stop learning. So if we have access to all the information in the world, how can that possibly be a bad thing? How can that possibly be dangerous? See, we spoke earlier in the Ashra, I think it was maybe two days ago, we spoke about how knowledge and information has been suppressed from us. How people try to keep knowledge away from us. So in the times of the Imams and the Ahl al they would arrest the Imams or they would try to kill the Ahl al In the times of their companions or in spaces where their companions were around, they banned people from speaking about the Imams. They said, you're not allowed to speak about the Imams, otherwise you'll suffer consequences. You'll be arrested or you'll be, uh, you'll be imprisoned, you'll be killed, whatever it is. And then further on down the line, what did they do? They started burning the books of the Shia school of thought. Why? So that people can't read. They can't find out through the books about what the Imam said, what the Ahlul Bayt taught, what the Prophet taught us. Why? Because they wanted to suppress knowledge. They wanted to stop people from learning. Why? Because learning is great for an individual. It's not great for institutions. For somebody who wants to hold on to power, every single person having that ability to think freely is not a good thing. Somebody who wants to hold on to their wealth Everybody being able to think freely is not a good thing. And we see this in modern day as well, this suppression of knowledge. It's done in a very different way though. So for instance, if you look at the education industry, STEM, science, maths, these kind of subjects, they're very heavily sponsored. They're paid for. So you guys in school, you might not know this, but big, big companies are paying for you to learn your maths and your English. They're paying to promote those subjects. But see, there is such a thing as creative thinking A-level. There is such a thing as analytical thinking A-level. There is such a thing as mind skills A-level, mindfulness A-level. You never hear about those. Why? Because nobody wants to pay for that. Because nobody wants you to be mindful. Nobody wants you to think critically. No, they just want you to know, this is how I solve X problem. So yeah, that's all they want. X problem has Y solution. When you see that problem, you apply that solution. You don't need to think about it, just do it. It's the suppression of knowledge. But now, we have so much knowledge at our fingertips, so much knowledge available to us. How can that be a bad thing? Quite simply, have you guys ever heard the saying that the best hiding place is in plain sight? See, if I give you 100,000 books to read and I tell you I'm looking for one sentence, what's the chance of you finding it? See, the more information I give you, the more the information that you need is hidden within it. All of a sudden, you can't find what you're looking for. All of a sudden, what you actually want is so much harder to pick up. I was actually so, you know, for this lecture and for the lecture series, I use Google to do research. And it says at the top, when you, research, when you type something into Google, when you make a search, it'll tell you how many results it gave you and in how many seconds. And I saw something like 30,000 in 0 0.4 seconds. Now, you tell me, 
if I want to find one very specific piece of information, and all of a sudden I've got 30,000 different results that I can look through, how likely is it that I'm finding exactly what I want? See, here's the thing. When there's so much information there, so much for you to look through, it makes what you really need very difficult to find. And at the same time, Google, I'll give you an example here, Google, it manipulates those search results as well. So for instance, depending on where you live, you'll get different search results. If I were to type in Islam is, and just leave it at that, Google's autofill on the search results, it will give me all sorts of different responses. Let's say I live in a very radical part of America, where Islam is not liked, it's not favored. If I type Islam is, the autofill options on that search result, the drop down list that you get, are more likely to say is dangerous. Islam is a terrorist religion. Islam is, and all these negative results. But if I were to go and search that in a Muslim country, Islam is, and the autofill will give me beautiful. Islam is the growest, biggest, fast growing religion in the world. Islam is a religion of peace. All these different kinds of things. See, what we see is manipulated. The information we get is manipulated. And we see this very much, for those of you who are a little bit older, when we look at voting preferences, when we look at elections, right? Because if you are an ardent Labour supporter, for instance, you'll look at everything that's going on in the Conservative Party and you'll think, how can anyone support them? There's so much information, so much going on, just to show that the Conservative Party are terrible and they make all these mistakes and all these blunders. How can anybody support them? At the same time, if you ask a Tory supporter, if you ask a Conservative supporter, blah, 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 what you think of the Labour Party, they're going to tell you, oh, they're all deluded, they have no idea what they're doing, their maths doesn't add up, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Because what you're seeing, the information you're getting, is entirely different from one another. You could be best mates with somebody, but the information you get is completely different. All of these things are programmed to give you certain outcomes and certain responses. And I'm going to speak about that kind of programming. I'm going to speak about what it does. And the overarching issue with it is addiction. The addiction that it brings, because we are, we're addicted to our phones. We're addicted to socials, we're addicted to the digital world, is the biggest danger of it. And to give you, again, it's another quote from the same man, Tristan Harris. He says, on average, a person will pick up their phone 150 times a day. When I say pick up their phone, I mean literally just do this. You know? If I can get mine out of my pocket. It'll be on the table, they'll pick it up, look at it. That's it, you picked it up 150 times a day. Now tell me, 150 times a day, that's not a small number. Let's think about, for instance, we're in this lecture for one hour, yeah? The lecture's not half one hour really, but yeah, 45 minutes, we're here. In that time, the majority of you won't have picked up your phone once. That's one hour, 1 24th of the day. Let's say you spend six hours to sleep, it should be more close, it should be close to seven or eight, but none of us really get that much sleep anymore. Let's say you get six hours of sleep. You've not picked up your phone in that time. Let's say you're at school and you're not allowed to pick up your phone. You've not picked up your phone in that time. In the little time that remains, that four or five hours, you pick up your phone 150 times. And the question that Tristan Harris, this developer, asked is, do you consciously make a decision 150 times in the day to pick up your phone and look at it? Or is that something that your mind's just doing automatically, that your body's just doing on its own accord? Because if it's something that you consciously do, then you definitely have an addiction of some sort to constantly want to look at your phone. I mean, I know some of you guys in here are popular, but nobody is that popular that you're getting that many notifications to pick up your phone 150 times a day. But then there's the flip side. If you're doing it subconsciously, without even noticing it, then that means somewhere along the line, your mind's been programmed without you even noticing to keep checking that phone, to keep looking at that phone, to keep seeing what it has for you. And if you think that's an exaggeration, 150 times you pick up your phone, for those of you who have an iPhone, it will tell you in the screen time section how many times you've picked up your phone. If you look at it, you think, that can't be right. You look at it and think, that's way more than I've picked up my phone. But it's true. If you look at your screen time, it will tell you. You've been on your phone for five hours today. You think, five hours how? Five hours where? Where did I spend five hours on my phone? But that's what it says. That's what it tells you. And the thing is, we don't even realize we're doing it. But why? What's, what is it about these things that make them so addictive? 
The first thing is they are addictive by design. This isn't an accident. They are made to be addictive. The first thing is, and this is a very big danger as well, you know that instant gratification. People talk about it all the time now. Instant gratification, that immediate feeling of pleasure, that immediate kind of boost of some kind of happiness or niceness, or just a, you know, a, a nice feeling in general that you get when you post a photo and someone likes it, or you get a comment, or something like that happens. Your phone buzzes and someone's messaged you. Some messages make you smile more than others, but regardless, you get a feeling of gratification as soon as you get that message, as soon as your phone buzzes. And in particular, when you're posting a photo and you get a like, that like, it gives you a little boost the first time. When I say that like, I mean, you know, maybe that 50 likes or that 100 likes. Back when, you know, when I first started using Instagram, it was when it turned into numbers, because it'll tell you who's liked your, who's liked your post until you've got, I think it was like 11 likes, and then it just has the numbers, and those numbers keep rising. And as they rise, it feels good, especially the first time. And then you post again. It doesn't feel as good anymore. Why? Because in life, we're always looking to pick up on that thrill, pick up on that little boost of dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical in our mind that is released when we reward ourselves, when we're happy, when it's just like the pleasure chemical. We're looking for that constantly. And I'll give you an example. Again, this applies to everything we do. So, I remember I once went, it was a few years ago now, I went skydiving. And I remember as soon as I landed, my first thought was, I'm never going to get a thrill like that again. No matter what I do, I won't get that thrill again. And you keep searching for it, you want it. And you know, you've got these adrenaline junkies and you think, what are they doing? They're just searching for the next thrill. And it's such a natural thing, we all do it, it's normal. And that's why, for instance, when you're playing a game, if there's no new levels, if there's nothing getting harder, you won't get a new thrill because you don't feel like you achieved anything better. You're not getting any more dopamine than you got the first time. Same thing with drugs. So somebody who starts off with a light drug, let's say, I'm calling it a light, but you know, they start off with a particular drug. Let's say they start off smoking weed, yeah? After a while, that's not going to have the same impact anymore. It's not going to feel good anymore. Why? Because you need something better. You need the next level. You need something higher. Same thing with dopamine. Those likes, they're not going to feel good after a little while. You need something bigger, you need something better, you need something higher. And if you can't find that, then all of a sudden, you feel this emptiness inside and you don't really know what it is or where it's come from. It's because your body was expecting to get that kind of dopamine release. It was expecting to have that pleasure. It was expecting to enjoy that, but it didn't. You're not sure why. But all of a sudden, you feel a bit shallow inside, you feel a bit empty inside. Even if your post is doing numbers, even if you've got all the likes that you wanted to get, even if you're getting the comments from your mates that you wanted, it just doesn't feel the same. It detracts from your contentment. It pulls away from your happiness. You're feeling that, yeah, my life is going well. What I've got is good enough. Because all of a sudden, what you're looking for, that little dopamine boost, it's not good enough anymore what you did to get that. Because posting that photo and getting those likes just doesn't do it anymore. All of a sudden, it's not the same. The second thing is another thing we spoke about yesterday when we were talking about gaming. We spoke about novelty. We search for new things in life. We want something new in life all the time. It's normal. Natural human reaction, natural human need. We want something new in life all the time. Now, there's something called intermittent variable rewards. This basically is the same kind of process that they've got, the same kind of thing that works for the slot machines in Vegas. Yeah? Where when you pull that lever down on the slot machine, you don't know what you're going to get. It could be a reward, it could not be a reward. It could be anything. This pinpoints the reason why we pick up our phone phones 150 times a day. Because you don't know if you're going to have a notification or not. You don't know if there'll be something there. You don't know if there'll be a message from that person. You don't know if there'll be a notification from Insta or Snap or Twitter or TikTok or whatever it is. But you're looking for that reward. You're looking for that kind of, oh, oh yeah, I did get something nice. You don't know if you'll get it, but you might. And the variability of the fact that you might get it or you might not, we kind of feed off of that. And that's why we keep going back to our phones. It's the same thing and the same reason why when you're hungry, you keep going back to the fridge. Because in your mind, you think, maybe there's something there. You never know. So you keep going back. You know there's nothing in the fridge. There was nothing there five minutes ago. There's nothing there in five minutes. There's nothing there now. But you keep going back and just opening the fridge and looking at it. It's the same kind of thing with your phone. You pick it up and you think, maybe there'll be something there. Maybe there won't. Your phone hasn't buzzed at all. You know it buzzes when you get a notification. It hasn't buzzed, but still you look at it, look at it, maybe you got something. It's the same thing when you refresh your feed. 
Maybe there'll be something new there. Maybe there'll be something interesting there. Maybe Fabrizio Romano has posted a new update. Maybe Arsenal is signing someone. You never know. You might get something. You might not. And we're looking for that. And we feed off of that feeling that maybe there is, maybe there isn't. You need that. It's something that we have to look for. And then there's obviously the fact that each of your feeds is made very personal to you, what you like. And when you look at the amount of data that these companies hold on us, when I say these companies, I'm talking about like Facebook and TikTok and Twitter and Insta and Snap. When you look at the amount of data they hold on us, it's insane. They track how long you spend on each video. They track what made you swipe off the app. They track which video kept you attracted for the longest. They track what you liked and what you commented and all of that, but there's so much more depth to it. And we don't realize this a lot of the time. How curated it is, how much it is tuned in to me personally, as an individual. Because what I'm looking for, so for instance, normally my feed is entirely just football and nothing else. It's all Arsenal, that's all it is. All of a sudden, as Mohoram comes closer, I'm starting to see stuff about Islam on my feed, I'm starting to see stuff about Kerbal on my feed. But I didn't like anything, I didn't bring any of that up, but it's just starting to show up on my feed. Why? Because the algorithms know, they understand, and they can make judgments based on what I do on my feed. If I like a post, Instagram for instance, when there's a post with like five, six posts within that same one, like a carousel, if I flick through them and see what they are, it's the taking note. Okay, so he stopped at this one. This thing interested him. This thing drew his attention. And it constantly tries to get your attention by curating your feed, making your feed very personal to you, making it something about you. But why is it so dangerous? Why is it so important that we recognize the danger? And how does that, all of that, Okay, they hold a lot of data on me, fine. Okay, they keep dragging me back, fine. Why is it dangerous? The first thing, with the addiction, right? And a lot of you young guys will notice this with the older people around you. Because it's an addiction, it's difficult to say no to it when you need to. And when I mean you need to, I'm talking about the different moments where you can't be on your phone. The different moments where you shouldn't be looking at your phone, looking at that screen. One for you younger guys is when you're studying. When you're studying, when you're doing your work, it's best for you not to pull out your phone, because if you do that, then all of a sudden, you're going to be scrolling for however long you scroll for, half an hour, one hour, two hours, three hours, and you won't even realize it. Even more dangerous is when you're driving, pulling out your phone when you're driving. And you'll notice sometimes people text and they drive, but sometimes people open their phones and they're on their phone scrolling through Instagram while they drive. What is the need in that moment while you're driving, while you should be looking at the road, to be scrolling through Instagram. It's not even like someone's messaged you and you're replying to them. You're just scrolling. That's all you're doing. But it's this addiction. It keeps pulling you back, even at the worst of times, even in the moments where you really shouldn't be looking at that phone. You're looking at that phone. The other thing is that it's an influence on your behavior. It affects how, you work, how your mind works, how your body works. In the same way where we said, you know, you're picking up your phone 150 times, that's, your, that's you being wired to do a certain thing, to do a certain action. All these influences on our behavior, it means that somebody else has a say on what I do. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. Somebody else has a say on what it is that I do with my life. Now, when I say somebody else, we think of you know Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, we think these are massive companies. They're not. When you actually look at the people doing the coding, making the app, making the algorithm, they're not masses and masses and massive teams, no. That's five, maybe ten people deciding how you will be manipulated, deciding how your behavior will change based on their algorithm. And the people who make it insist that it's not something that is done maliciously. They insist that, look, we're just trying to increase profits by making people enjoy the app more. Whether that's true or not, to have somebody else influence your behavior without you even knowing who they are, what they are, what they think like, what they want, is a very dangerous thing. Another issue is what we call polarization. You know, we spoke earlier about political parties and people disagreeing with each other. See, when you completely disagree with somebody so much because you haven't got the ability to see their point of view, purely because you've got no, you haven't even got a drop of the information that they see, it leads to what we call polarization, where all of a sudden you really, really dislike each other. You really don't like each other to the point of hate, to the point of anger. 
and there's been a sharp increase in violent crime. People getting violent towards other people. Why? Because what they see on their feed is anger. What they see on their feed has made them angry to the point where they've gone and acted on something. And again, when we're talking about that information, another danger is misinformation, false information. Now, there was, there was an incident that's kind of been coined as pizza game. And I'm not talking about when Fabregas threw a pizza at Alex Ferguson. I'm talking about in America, there was a moment where all of a sudden, it was during the 2016 elections, there was this rumor spread that a particular pizzeria in Washington, D.C. was kidnapping children and selling them under the guise of pizzas. So you order a particular pizza and you get a child. Now, on the face of it, that sounds ridiculous, that sounds absurd, but people started to believe it. And because these algorithms are built in a way where they attract your attention based on what you like, this stuff started gathering so much traction. So many people started looking at it and seeing it on their feeds because people like that. We like things that are divisive. We like things that are kind of more threatening and more angry. And people saw this and more and more people started seeing this. More and more people started really believing it until one man picked up a rifle and went to that pizzeria. And he went to that pizzeria to free the kids. There were no kids there. There was nothing going on. This was just a bit of fake news that got spread online. And all of a sudden, there's real world consequences. There's a man standing in your shop, your pizzeria, with a gun pointed at you saying, where are the kids? That's dangerous. When nobody's checking the news to check if it's correct, checking what you see to check if it's correct, that's dangerous. That's danger right there. And there's not much you can do about it. The other thing is, this is the last one I'll mention because this is probably the one that most people will experience at some point. It's a fear of missing out. When you see on your made stories that everybody's gone out and you're not there, all of a sudden you start to think, oh, I've missed out. Fair enough, you can feel that, that's normal, right? But it's when it starts to affect you even more, when it starts to hurt you even more, you think, oh, why didn't they invite me? Why couldn't I go? Or, for instance, they did invite you and you couldn't go there because but suddenly you had to come here for the majlis. All of a sudden you've got resentment for this majlis. Why? Because you're seeing all your mates' stories that they all went bowling, but you had to go to the mosque. And that fear of missing out, it can influence how you think. It can change how you see the world, how you see what's going on around you. It can change how you interact with your friends. If you feel like you're missing out on things that your friends are doing, all of a sudden you can start convincing yourself that your friends don't like you. You can start convincing yourself that they don't want you to go out with them. But there's no truth in that at all. Your friends would love it if you were there, but because you've got this kind of fear of missing out, because you've got this feeling that I'm being left out, now all of a sudden you've got all these thoughts in your head. Now all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, you know what, I'm not going to go there because they don't want me there. Even though they've invited you, they've asked you to come, but you to tell yourself, no, I'm not going to go, they don't want me there. You've convinced yourself of the fact, and again, it's not true. There's all these different dangers. These are dangers in this world, kind of worldly dangers. Tomorrow we're going to look at what are the religious risks. How does this digital age affect our deen, affect our religion? How does it affect our Islam? Because it does. It seriously risks having a major impact on your afterlife. When we say that Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment will question us for everything that we've done in this life, that means everything. You think Twitter doesn't count? Of course it does. You think Insta doesn't count? Of course it does. Everything we do in this life we are accountable for. One day we have to answer to Allah Azza wa Jal for that. So how then does the digital world impact that? What things do we have to watch out for? We're going to look at that tomorrow, inshallah. But right now, in this moment, as we approach Mother time, we spoke about that resentment that you might feel having to be here while your mates are out bowling or they're there doing something else. I want to explain to you how important it is to sit here. I want to give you a taste and a glimpse of the importance of this Farshi Azar, of these majalis of Imam Hussein Les. There was a man who was a student of our eighth Imam, Imam Ali Raza, alayhi salatu wa salam. He was a student of the Imam and then he moved away. And he'd always write to the Imam and invite him to things as his life went on. So 
So when the man got married, he wrote to the Imam and invited the Imam to his wedding. The Imam didn't go. He then had a child. He wrote to the Imam and he invited the Imam to the birth of his child. The Imam wouldn't go. His wedding anniversary, he called people around, he called the Imam as well, the Imam wouldn't go. His son was getting married at this point. It's been years and years. His son's getting married at this point. He writes to the Imam and the Imam wouldn't go. And he writes to the Imam, he says, you're an Imam, are you upset with me? Have I done something wrong? The Imam says, no, you've not done anything wrong. He says, every time I've invited you, you've said no. Every time I've called upon you, you've refused to attend. The Imam says, look, when you called upon me, it's been the time of Azar for my Imam Hussein, for my grandfather Hussein. The man says, then tell me, what do I need to do to get you to come to my house? The Imam says, it's simple. Hold a majlis for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. If you hold a majlis for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, I will come to your house. So the man does. He holds a majlis, he invites the Imam. He's getting ready to go to the Imam's house to pick him up and bring him to his own house. When he sees that Imam Ali Raza alayhi salam is already standing at his door, he comes to the Imam and says, Ya Imam, I would have come to get you. You came here yourself. The Imam says, well, there's a majlis of Imam Hussein. I go there myself, I do not need to be called, I do not need to be brought there, I go there myself immediately. The Imam is telling us, no matter where there is a majlis for Imam Hussein, the Imams are present, the Imams are there. So the majlis begins. When it comes time for Masai, the lights are dim. When the lights come back on, the man, the student, he looks around and he cannot see his Imam anywhere, he cannot see where the Imam has gone. He searches around. And what does he find? He finds our Imam sitting by the door where everyone has left their shoes. He comes up to the Imam and says, Ya Imam, why are you sat here where the shoes are? The Imam looks at the host and he says, did you not see what was going on in that room? Did you not see what happened? He says, why, what happened? He says, in that room is Sayyid Zahra. In that room is Ali and in that suit, in that room, in that majlis is Rasul Khuda. I took a step back to make space for the Ahlul Bayt salam. They come to every majlis. Everywhere you say the name of Hussein, Zahra comes from heaven. Ali and he comes from heaven. Rasulullah, he comes from heaven. This is not Ali Raza salam. They say for Imam Jafar Sadiq salam, when the month of Muharram would come, the people of Medina, they would not need to look towards the sky to see if the moon had come out. They would not need to look towards the sky to see if the month of Muharram had arrived. Instead, they would just listen out for the tears of the house of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq Instead, they would listen out to see if they could hear the cries. When they hear the cries coming from the house of Sadiq al Muhammad, they would know that Muharram has arrived. But these are our Imams. Do you understand the love that our Prophet had for Imam Hussein al-Islam? the house of Sadiq Awal Muhammad, when Muharram would arrive, you would hear them crying from outside the house. But Rasulullah, when he first holds Imam Hussein Islam in his arms, he's not waiting for Muharram. When Imam Hussein is born, Rasulullah holds Imam Hussein in his arms. He starts to cry tears. When, Imam, when Rasulullah, he comes into his home one time, he tells the Umm Salma, look Umm Salma, I'm very tired. I'm going to go into the room. I want to relax for a little while. I want to sleep for a little while. Don't let anybody come into the room. Don't let anybody come and disturb me. Even Umm Salma, she watches vigilantly. But at some point, Imam Hussein alayhi salam enters the room by accident. She could not stop him. She does not notice. He enters the room. When she runs inside to take him out, she runs inside, picks up Imam Hussein to take him out of the room. What does Rasulullah say? He says, Umm Salma, do not move Hussein away from me. Keep my Hussein with me. Again, there is another time Rasulullah tells me, Umm Salma, Umm Salma, do not let anybody enter the room. I will be resting right now. Bibi Umm Salma, again, she stands at the entrance of the room. She doesn't want to let anybody into the room. But what does ha what happens? Imam Hussein alayhi salam comes forward, maybe four years old at this age, Imam Hussein. He comes to the room, he tries to go in. This time Bibi Umm Salma sees him, she stops him. She says, Hussein, no, your grandfather is resting. He has said he does not want anybody to go inside. Imam Hussein looks up at Bibi Umm Salma with his innocent eyes and he says to her, he said he does not want anybody to go inside. Does that anybody include his Hussein? Bibi Umm Salma says he did not tell me who it does and does not include. All he said is nobody is to go inside. Imam Hussein turns around and begins to walk away. This small child begins to leave. From behind Bibi Umm Salma, Rasulullah comes out of the room. He says, Umm Salma, what did you do? You sent my Hussein away. Rasulullah, whenever he would leave his room, he would make sure he was presentable in impeccable condition. His clothes 
ready, he would make sure that he has his imam on his head. But this time when he sees Hussein walking away from his room, Rasulullah, no imam on his head. Rasulullah wearing his clothes for the room. He rushes out, he chases after Imam Hussein, he picks him up, he holds him, he takes him back into the room. The door closes. After a short while, the Umm Salma enters the room and what does she see? Rasulullah has taken his shirt off, he has taken off his kurta, his labas. He has Imam Hussein alayhi salam on his chest and what does she see? One by one, Rasulullah is kissing every part of the body of Hussein. First he kisses the neck of Hussein, then he kisses his arms. He begins to kiss his chest, then he begins to kiss his legs. Bibi Umm Salma asks Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabi Allah, what is it? Why do you kiss Hussein in this way? What has happened? And again she sees Rasulullah. Allah crying tears for Hussein. It is not Muharram at this time. The Prophet did not need to wait for Muharram. The Prophet tells Bibi Umm Salma, Salma, when I went on Mi'raj, Allah Azza wa Jal told me, Allah Azza wa Jal gave me the news that I will have a daughter. He gave me the news that he will bestow upon me Kawthar. I was very overjoyed. But then Allah Azza wa Jal told me that I would have to face a test as well. Then Allah Azza wa Jal told me I would have to face a test from him. I uh, said to Allah Azza wa Jal, Ya Allah, whatever test you give me, I will accept it. Whatever test you give me, I have no problem with it. Allah Azza wa Jal said, Ya Rasulullah, are you sure? The Prophet said, I am sure. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya Muhammad, the first test, you will see your brother Ali shunned in the streets. You will see people attack him. You will see people leave him. Rasulullah <coughs> says, I accept it. That's fine, I will take it. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Ya Rasulullah, the second most difficult test. You will see your daughter Zahra in the streets. You will see her go to the courts and people will call your daughter a liar. Rasulullah says, ya, ya Allah, if this is your will, then I accept it. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, the most difficult test you will face, Ya Rasulullah, is your grandson Hussein will be alone in the battlefield of Karbala. On one side will be all the angels, on one side will be all the jinns, in front of him will be an army, behind him will be Zainab, behind her will be the women and children, Hussein will find himself alone in that moment, are you ready for that sacrifice? I won't tell you what Rasulullah said, all I will tell you is what happened on that day of Ashura, the time comes when the Asr approaches, Shimmer is sat on the chest of Imam Hussein, now now, all the prophets, they look to Rasulullah, they say, Ya Rasulullah, forgive us. We cannot watch what is about to happen to Hussein. They leave the sands of Karbala and return to the heavens. Now, Rasulullah, he looks towards Imam Ali, Sayyid Zahra, and Imam Hassan. He says, look, what happens now is between you. Muhammad will not stand and watch what happens to Hussein. Ali, Zahra, Hassan, now it is between you and Hussein. Now, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he watches as Rasulullah leaves, he turns to his two parents, he says to them, I cannot watch what is about to happen to my brother, it is now between you, Ya Ali, and you, Ya Zahra, it is between you two and Hussein. now Imam Hassan alayhi salam leaves the battlefield of Karbala, Imam Ali then turns to Sayyid Zahra, he says, Zahra, Ali will not be able to watch as the knife strikes the neck of Hussein, Zahra, from here on, it is between you and Hussein. Zahra Ali will not stand here to watch. Imam Ali leaves the plains of Karbala. In that moment, Sayyid Zahra turns and looks towards the heavens. She calls out, Ya Allah, bear witness. When Adam and Nuh and Ibrahim left, when Rasulullah left, when Hassan ibn Saba left, when Ali ibn Murtaza left, there was nobody left standing in Karbala. Nobody left to watch Hussein's final sacrifice, except Hussein's mother Zahra. Zahra says this. She sits down beside her son. She takes the head of Hussein in her lap as Shimmer draws his sword. Allah, 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 Allah,